In the previous lecture, we discussed Carnot's engine, which is essentially an ideal version of a heat engine that utilizes a reversible cycle. So recall that inside a Carnot cycle, we have four different processes taking place. So let's look at the following diagram. So our x-axis is the volume and the y-axis is the pressure. So there are four different reversible processes taking place. So when we go from initial position 1 to position 2, that is an isothermic process and let's call that process A. Now when we go from position 2 to position 3, that is an adiabatic process and let's call that process 2. Now when we go from 1 to 2 and from 2 to 3, our volume increases so that means the gas inside Carnot's engine also increases. Next we go from position 3 to position 4 and that is once again an isothermic process. Let's call that process 3 but now our volume decreases so that means gas is compressed. And finally when we go from position 1 to position or from position 4 to position 1 we return to our initial position and that process is an adiabatic process. So our temperature decreases. Now let's suppose at position 1 our temperature is given to be TH and at position 3 our temperature is given to be TL. Now when we go from point 1 to point 2 heat flows into our system. So let's say the amount of heat flows into our system is given by QH. And let's suppose when we go from position 3 to position 4, heat is lost by our system. So heat flows out of our system and let's say that QL heat flows out of our system. Now, in this lecture, we essentially want to determine the equation for the efficiency of Carnot's engine. Now recall the efficiency of any engine is given by the following equation. The efficiency given by lowercase e is equal to 1 minus the ratio of QL divided by QH where QL is the heat that flows out of our system and QH is the heat that flows into our system when we go from position 1 to to position 2. Now this gives us an equation for the efficiency of any heat engine and this includes the Carnot engine. But what we want to show in this lecture is we want to show that for a Carnot engine using an ideal gas the efficiency only depends on the temperatures TL and TH where TL is the temperature of our ideal gas at position 3 and TH is our, is our temperature of our ideal gas at position 1. So let's begin by examining process A. So once again process A is an isothermal process and that means the temperature remains constant. So when we go from point 1 to point 2 our ideal gas expands and that means that heat is gained by our system and the heat is given by QH. Now because the change in temperature in any isothermal process is zero, that implies that the change in internal energy of our ideal gas must also be zero. Now, according to the second law of thermodynamics, the change in internal energy of our ideal gas is given by the heat that flows into our system plus the work that is done by our system on the surroundings. Because this quantity is zero, that implies that QH, the heat that flows into our system, is equal to the work that is done by our system on the surroundings when we go 
from position one to position two. Recall from the lecture on isothermal processes, we said that the work done by our system on the surroundings is equal to the product of N, the number of moles, multiplied by R, the universal gas constant, multiplied by TH, the temperature given in Kelvins, multiplied by the natural log of the ratio of volume two divided by volume one where volume one is the volume at position one and volume two is the volume at position two. Now because W is equal to Q in process A, we see that QH is equal to this quantity. So that means the heat that is gained by our system is equal to the following equation. And let's call this equation I. Now let's move on to process C. Process C is once again an isothermal process. That means the change in temperature is zero. The only difference is now instead of expanding, we're compressing our gas. And that means heat is lost by our ideal gas. How much heat is lost? Well, it's given by QL. So if we follow the same exact steps as in part A for part C, we get the following result. The amount of heat that is lost by our system when we go from point 3 to point 4 QL is equal to the work that is done on our system by the surroundings, which is equal to the product of N, the number of moles R, the universal gas constant TL, the temperature at position 3, multiplied by the natural log of V3 divided by V4. Notice we switch these because the sign is negative. We gain heat here and we lose heat here. Now, let's move on to pathways B and pathways D. So let's examine uh, processes B and D. So in these two processes, we have an adiabatic process taking place. And because we're dealing with an ideal gas, we could use the following equation that we derived in the lecture on adiabatic processes. So the product of the pressure multiplied by the volume raised to a constant, which is our alpha, is equal to a constant. Now the alpha is simply the ratio of the molar specific heat at constant pressure to the molar specific heat at constant volume. That is what we call our alpha. Now, from this equation, we have equation 1 and equation 2. Equation 1 states that the product of pressure at point 2 and the volume at point 2 raised to alpha is equal to the product of the pressure at point 3 times the volume at point 3 raised to the alpha. And likewise, we call equation 2 the following. So, we we have the product P4 multiplied V4 to the alpha is equal to P1 multiplied by V1 to the alpha. So we call this equation 1 and equation 2. And by the way, we call this equation equation 2i. Now, let's move on to the following step. Recall the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law states that the product of the pressure and the volume is equal to nRT, where n is simply the number of moles, r is the gas constant, T is the temperature given in Kelvins. So we can rearrange this equation and get the following result. The product of the pressure and the volume divided by the temperature is equal to a constant n multiplied by r. Because our number of moles remain constant, that means at any given point, the n remains constant. And, the, and this ratio also remains constant. And that's exactly where we get equation 3 and equation 4. The product of the pressure and the volume at point 2 divided by the temperature at point 2 is equal to the product and the volume at point 3 divided by the temperature at point 3. And likewise, the product of the pressure and the volume at point 4 divided by the temperature at point 4 is equal to the product of our pressure and volume at point 1 divided by the temperature at point 1. Let's call this equation 3 and equation 4.
Now, let's take equation 1 and divide it by equation 3. So we divide equation 1 by equation 3, left and right, and we get the following result. The temperature H multiplied by the volume at point 2 raised to the power of alpha minus 1 is equal to the temperature low multiplied by V3 to the power alpha minus 1. And likewise, we divide equation 2 and equation 4, and we get the following result. So let's call this equation 5 and equation 6. Finally, we take equation 5 and divide it by equation 6, and we get the following result. So we have the ratio V2 divided by V1, the volume at point 2 divided by the volume at point 1 raised to the power alpha minus 1 is equal to the ratio of V3, the volume at point 3 divided by the volume at point 4 raised to the same power alpha minus 1. Now, these will cancel, and we're left with the following ratio. The ratio of V2 divided by V1 is equal to V3 divided by V4. Now, finally, let's take equation 2i and divide it by equation i. So, equation 2i divided by equation i gives us QL divided by QH. Notice, because this ratio, V2 divided by V1, is equal to V3 divided by V4. The natural log of V3 divided by V4 is equal to the natural log of V2 divided by V1. So QL divided by QH, this divided by this, is equal to TL divided by TH. Because the N's will cancel, the R's will cancel, and the natural logs will also cancel. And we're left with TL divided by TH. So we have TL divided by TH. So, because TL divided by TH is equal to QL divided by QH, we can replace QL divided by QH with TL divided by TH. And we get the following result. So, the efficiency of a Carnot engine is equal to 1 minus TL divided by TH. And this is commonly known as Carnot's theorem. So, we showed that for a Carnot engine using an ideal gas, the efficiency only depends on the temperatures TH and TL. And what Carnot's theorem basically tells us if we're dealing with two different Carnot's engine that have the same temperature TL and the same temperature TH, that implies that those two different Carnot's engine will have the same exact efficiency.